And we have been in a series called As For Me In My House. This is a declaration that we see in Scripture. And we've been laying it before our congregation saying, what would it look like and what would happen if you started making the same declaration over your home, if you adopted this as a mantra for yourself to say, come what may, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. We can't control culture and we can't manipulate society and people aren't robots and they didn't come with remotes and so we can't dictate what other people do. But as for us, as followers of Christ within the confines of our homes, we're, we're gonna serve the Lord and maybe, just maybe, out of the overflow of God's goodness in our home, may God use our family to have an influence and an impact in the world around us. Because how many of you guys know the world needs solid, Solid, healthy, thriving families, and maybe, just maybe, uh, if we were to lean into God's work in our homes, God would use us in uh, ways that we don't even know to pray for. And so that is the heartbeat behind this series. I, I do have to say, uh, the first part of this message is going to be specific to marriage. Probably the first 20% of this message uh, will be uh, specific to marriage. And then the final 80% is gonna have to do with communication. So as we jump into the marriage side of things, I know some of you are gonna think to yourself, well, I'm not married, I'm single, this doesn't apply to me. I would just say, hang with me. For one, uh, chances are you know someone who's married or at some point, God may have someone in mind to bring into your life. Uh, this could be a head start for you to prepare for a really critical and important relationship. Uh, but I do think in terms of communication, we all can get better. Come on, wave a hand at me if you can improve in your communication. Come on, wave a hand at me if you're seated next to someone who can improve in their communication, yeah? And we all can. You know, Chris and I were talking this past week you know, just about uh, the areas in which we've come up short in our own communication. And my goodness, I continue still to this day to, to put my foot in my mouth. And, and so it's this humble journey of walking faithfully with God, you know, just depending upon his grace and leaning into uh, his ability to redeem all things and to uh, improve our character and our approach to life. And it makes me think of early on in our marriage, uh, Chris and I had some really comical fights. Uh, looking back, I can't remember what we were fighting about, uh, but I can remember how we were fighting. And there are some really funny ones. Before we had kids, uh, we had a, you know, tried to, uh, well, we were trying to figure it out. When you come into a marriage, you know, they say the two become one, right? And the question sometimes is, well, which one? And so uh, you, you fight differently. We all come from different backgrounds. And there was one day I, I come home, Chris and I are in an argument, and I'm ready to like have it out. Anyone, you're just like, let's deal with it right here, right now. And at the time, I was working at a church that required more formal dress apparel. So I, I'm wearing slacks, I'm in some dress shoes, and I come walking in the door, and Kristen is gearing up to go for a run. Kristen had just, you know, we had just graduated college. Kristen was all American in cross country and track. And so the girl could run, which I've never understood people who like to run. If there's a base to get to, a bucket to score, a touchdown to score, I understand running. But just going out running uh, doesn't make a ton of sense to me. And I say, no, we're going to have this conversation, which Kristen then informs me, no, we're not. And so she says, I'm going for a run, and something in my, I don't know, arrogance, pride, egotistical side was like, well, then I'm going with you, and we're going to have this conversation on this run. And I could just tell this evil look in Kristen's eye that began to develop where she was thinking, well, this is going to be fantastic. And she takes me for a run like three miles through the neighborhood, and our neighbors probably thought we were crazy. We probably looked like a Mormon chasing the neighbor lady down the street, how I was dressed, how she was running. It was hilarious. And I, I look back, and I'm like, we look so ridiculous, myself specifically. Here I am in dress clothes, my collar's all sweaty and brown, and it was a terrible deal. And we just didn't know how to fight. We didn't know how to communicate. You fast forward that a couple years, we have kids. Uh, Riley was about 18 months, our oldest, and Kristen was pregnant with our son, Cannon. And I was working at a church at the time that maybe some of you can relate to this. It had uh, a culture that was just constantly working around the clock. There was no shutoff. There were not clear boundaries or healthy balance. And so it was very common in this environment to receive emails literally around the clock. People would wake up in the middle of the night and you, know, you would see the timestamp on an email, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And... 
I was this young leader who found myself in a position that came with more responsibility and I felt overwhelmed by the responsibility. And I started taking on a lot of the practices and the habits of this church and this workspace. So I would, in that season, come home, and maybe you can identify with this. I'd walk in the door, I'd sit at the table, I'd open my laptop, and I would continue working, and I would continue responding to emails. And one day, I get to the office, I open up my computer, I once again log into my email, and I received a message from Kristen. And the opening statement was, apparently, this is the only way to get a hold of you. And she went on to list out uh, my shortcomings as a husband and as a father. And I look back on that, and it's just comical to me how we were communicating. Uh, but I'm so thankful that over time, if you stick with it, you, you just get better. Can I get an amen? Over time, you improve and you learn some things and you develop some wisdom and some practical handles as to how do we manage this well. But what I will say, when it comes to marriage, uh, it becomes very apparent there are some consistent themes and issues that rise to the surface as the main issues of breakdown as well as the main issues that lead to healthy, thriving marriages. You can find both extremes uh, in these five, these five areas. And a lot of times it is our ability or inability to have productive conversations in these five areas uh, that lead to either a healthy marriage or a dysfunctional marriage. And, and here are the five areas. Faith, family, finances, fun, and sex. Now, you know I love a good alliteration. I like every word starting with the same letter. But I was terrified to Google an F word <laughs> that was synonymous for sex. But let, let's unpack it a little bit. You know, when it comes to faith, I am sometimes amazed by the number of couples who embark and commit to the most important relationship this side of heaven, uh, apart from Christ, without critically and thoroughly thinking through the faith conversation. Scripture would put it in terms of a yoke, and it would say that to do so, you don't want to be unequally yoked. Essentially what that means, if you think of an ox that has a yoke over its shoulder so it can pull whatever's behind it, when you have two oxes with you know, separate yokes, they pull the wagon in different directions. And essentially that's the idea, that if you're gonna be a person of faith, you have to understand your faith informs everything. It informs your identity and your purpose. It informs your values and your mission. It informs the way in which you view the world and others. It, it informs how you steward your finances. The list goes on and on. It is uh, indicative and shaping of every area of our life. And it is even most uh, recognizable in times of crisis, we talk about this often, uh, life is difficult. It's gonna come with pain and trials and inconvenience and confusion uh, because we live in a fallen world. You don't have to go looking for trouble. Trouble knows where to find you. And what becomes very apparent in most relationships and marriages is sometimes uh, the couple isn't on the same page in their faith and then they hit a crisis. And the question becomes, well, in this moment, what are we going to rely on? What are we going to take our cues from? Where do we find our foundation and our wisdom? What is our guide? And if you're not in lockstep and in agreement when it comes to your faith, when those moments come, uh, you are going to deviate from one another. And you will find that it is extremely difficult to navigate the difficulties of life when you and your spouse are not in lockstep when it comes to your faith. Uh, the second issue is your family. And here's the deal. Not a single one of us comes from a perfect family. Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, every single one of us comes from crazy units. You ever like sat at the dinner table on Thanksgiving and looked around like, wow, look where I come from. These people are nuts. You ever found that to be the case? Like somehow your parents are morons, but they raised you to be a genius? Like you see brokenness in everybody but yourself? No, we're all crazy. And though we all come from families with broken tendencies, we all come from families that did have some things right, maybe some areas of wisdom and some things that were done well or certain values. And what we don't 
give enough consideration to is not every family is the same. This is why one of my favorite statements is a fish never discovers water until it's out of it. You take a fish out the lake and put it on the deck of a boat, what does it start doing? Flopping around. But that same motion in the water is what? Swimming. And what happens is, is we are pulled out of you know, our family, when we step into marriage, that's what scripture says that, you know, you will leave and cleave essentially. And you step into a marriage and what you were once doing, what was once swimming in the dynamics of your family is now flopping around in this new dynamic. You are embracing and being a part of a new family unit as well as building a new family with your spouse. And it's just learning to identify what are the tendencies? What are the assumptions that we carry in, because again, the two become one, but which one? I grew up in a very male-dominant home. Uh, Kristen grew up in a very female-dominant home. And so sometimes you don't even realize that when you step into the marriage, uh, you bring with you expectations about what the roles are. And just to be clear, I wear the pants in my relationship. (laughs) Kristen just picks out which pants I'm gonna wear. So... (laughs) It kind of works out. But you know how this is. It's leaning in and just realizing, hey, you and me have to figure this out together. And there's gonna be some things that we've learned for the good and the bad from both of our families. And together, it's learning to navigate this journey together as we build our home. In addition to that, I would say faith, family, and then finances. Finances are always a key issue in marriages, which side note, I will say, I do think we tend to overrate money. And we're obsessed with it, and we overrate money and then undervalue time. And I think that's a paradigm that uh, should be flipped. I, I think I would rather uh, save, spend money to save time than spend time to save money. Uh, I think time is our most valuable commodity. And it is just having those clunky, at times even awkward, even initially tense conversations where you have to identify how are we going to approach the finance conversation in our home. And Kristen and I find that we uh, arrive at the same answer, but we have different math. (laughs) Anyone else? We just take a different approach to it. But you have to figure that out. What's our our budget and how are we going to manage that and what roles are we gonna put in place and expectations and how do we do it together? Finances are, are critical. In addition to that, I would say fun, which some might be surprised to see that on the list. But I am always super concerned For every couple that we encounter where we will ask the question, hey, what are some of your shared hobbies? And I'm amazed by how many couples don't have shared hobbies. And for the record, and you can push back on this, this is my opinion, you can disagree with me, that's fine. But I do not think your kids can be your shared hobby. And and our kids facilitate a lot of our calendar and we find a lot of great joy in experiencing activities and things that our kids participate in. But here's the deal. If your kids are your only shared hobby, you are setting yourself up for a crisis the moment those critters move out of the house. Because eventually they're gonna move out and there's going to be an immediate void. We don't know how to connect with one another, and we don't know how to enjoy each other's company apart from our children. And so you have to identify what are going to be our shared hobbies, because what is very common, and you see this all over in our society, is the guy has his things, that he hangs out with his buddies, and he has all his hobbies that he enjoys, and then the lady has her things and all the things that she enjoys, and eventually, unintentionally, They start to drift in different directions towards the joy and the fulfillment in their life. And then they realize, how did we drift so far apart? Well, we didn't enjoy and we didn't strategically find hobbies that we like together. And just know, this takes time. You just gotta, at times, try different things and explore different options. Early on, uh, Kristen tried to turn me into a runner. Like I said, I don't understand running. I don't enjoy running. And she had this idea, hey, let's you and I be one of those couples that run 5K races, which meant we would show up early morning on a Saturday and I would be in the back of the pack with a bunch of women pushing strollers and Kristen would be up front with a group from Kenya running this 5K. (laughs) And it was always an issue. And you just have to try and figure something out, but eventually you arrive at things and say, hey, we, we enjoy this. 
And this is cultivating a, a greater connection and friendship within the relationship, which then leads uh, to the final category, which is sex, which I know there's kids in the room and I have kids that are probably the same age as yours, so we're not gonna overdo this. Uh, but I will say, and this is speaking with broad generalizations. I know there's outliers and you may be that. Uh, but in most cases, uh, the man has a stronger appetite for physical things than the woman. And oftentimes I get the privilege of leveling the expectations of the guy heading into the marriage. And it's just understanding that marriage is far more relational than it is physical. But, but here's the thing you have to take away. The better it gets relationally, the better it gets physically. And, you know, we spend so much time winning a person's heart, but then we don't spend enough time and energy maintaining and keeping that person's heart. And so it's just learning to have those conversations. And especially the last one, I'll just say this. Guys, it, it's an awkward conversation for everybody. It's a level of intimacy and vulnerability uh, that is foreign to most, if not all of us. But I promise you, the couples that lean into it and the couples that just stay with it and the couples that keep the conversation open and honest and transparent, they get down the road and they have the marriage everybody else is looking at and desiring. And, and so it's just learning uh, to be a person who commits to the process, who puts in the work also that you can have a marriage that thrives. And, and so much of this hinges on communication, that every single one of these areas uh, requires you and I to be good and intentional and constantly improving in our communication. And they say in our communication, it breaks down into three categories, our words, our tone, and our body language. And, and here's what's wild to me. I read all these studies and research projects done on communication, and here's how they break down our communication. They say only 7% of your communication is your words. 38% of your communication is your tone, and 55% of your communication is your body language. I mean, that's wild. 93% of your communication isn't what you're saying. It's how you're saying it which for the next three seconds, everyone has permission to go ahead and elbow the person next to you. See, like tell your face, right? Adjust your tone. Your body language is a big thing. And here's the deal. Every single one of us, myself included, we're gonna come up short in this area. But it is learning to walk humbly, to acknowledge when we come up short and to just embrace the journey of growing in our communication and learning to be intentional as uh, it pertains especially to the most critical relationships in our life. Now, in the book, uh, in the Bible, uh, so many individuals had a lot to say about communication. One of them was Jesus's half-brother, James. In fact, he has his own book called James. Now, for the Bible geek in the room who wants some additional information, uh, what is fascinating about the book of James is one, it is kind of an Old Testament book dressed up like a New Testament book. If you read the book of James, it reads like the book of Proverbs. It is full of very practical and pointed wisdom and advice and how to live a godly life and Christian virtue. And what is fascinating to me about the book of James is if you're looking at it chronologically, the book of James, most would unanimously agree, was the first written letter or book in the New Testament. In fact, James was, he was a chief leader in the church of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 12, we read of the Jerusalem council. Now, this is important for most of us, if not all of us, because it was at the Jerusalem council that they decided to extend the gospel to the Gentiles. Up until that point, this was an exclusively Jewish faith. And in that moment, they said, no, we believe that this good news is for all people, not just the Jewish people. And so it was extended to the Gentiles. Anyone thankful that they had the faith and the discernment to say, yeah, them too? James was a part of that. James was a critical leader. And he, he writes this letter with deep concern for the community of faith. Now, again, if you're not a Christian, you're actually off the hook on this conversation. What we're gonna talk about today it doesn't apply to you. Uh, you get to peer in to our group therapy as we try to figure this out. But what we're gonna read today, James is specifically applying 
to the people of God, those who truly follow Christ and are a part of his family. And so for those of us who would call ourselves Christians, James is saying, pay attention to this. And right off the bat in chapter one, look what he says. He says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their, on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. I mean, so he's not pulling any punches. He's straight laced in his feedback. And he says, folks, those who walk around professing a faith that they clearly don't possess, well, that's shallow, that's empty, and it's pointless and it's worthless. And I think sometimes we can, we can see this still in, within our American culture. We love the idea of religion and its ability to help us manufacture facades also that we can go through life masquerading as virtuous people. But if you pay attention to our conversation, it becomes pretty apparent. Uh, it's an empty, shallow veneer uh, that deep behind it, uh, there's not a true redemptive work of grace taking place within our heart. And the overarching argument of James is faith without works is dead. Now that will be misinterpreted by many and lean in on this. What he's not saying is you are saved by your works. He's saying your works are evidence that you have been saved, that you have been so marked by the grace of God and the finished work of the cross that it has had a profound life-altering effect upon your life. Chuck Swindoll, who is... One of my favorite authors, he says it this way. Grace is not opposed to, no, he says grace is opposed to earning. It's not opposed to effort. So it, we're not out here trying to live in certain ways to earn God's love, but we do put forth effort in living in such a way that honors God and glorifies him to the best of our ability. And, you know, James is saying, yeah, those who claim to be religious uh, yet they cannot keep a tight rein on their tongues. They deceive themselves. What does that mean? They are lying to themselves and they have been sold on their own lie. Now that is some tense feedback that he's given us. Now watch where he picks up in chapter three on this idea of communication. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways, and anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Essentially what he's saying is be careful that your ambition doesn't get out of control where you run around just pursuing influence. Just patiently wait for God to entrust you with whatever measure of influence he feels you are worthy of carrying and responsible and able to handle. Because every single one of us, myself included, will be held accountable to the measure of our influence. And he says, do not just pursue becoming a teacher. Many of us shouldn't, he says. Because communication is hard, and the more influence you have as a teacher, the more accountable you will be held. Which is a daunting thing as someone who's preaching that passage. But it's a real thing. And he says, the person who is able to bridle their tongue is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. What is he saying? He's saying the most difficult thing you and I can ever accomplish in life is learning to communicate. In fact, a person who is perfect at communicating, if they've mastered that ability, well, they can master anything else is essentially what he's saying. Now watch what he goes on to say. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or uh, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself on fire by hell. I mean, James, if he's preaching in today's culture, he doesn't have much of an audience. <laughs> because this isn't the type of message that builds a crowd. 
It's the type of message that builds a Christian. He's saying, when you are a part of the family of God, you take on different behaviors and you think about your relationships more critically and you operate more intentionally and you are keenly aware of the role that your words play in the matter. And he's saying, listen, if you and I are going to call ourselves Christians, we can't be living towards heaven, yet living like hell. He says, what would happen if we as a community of people had so much courage, we asked the question, is there anything in my life that is a living contradiction? Is there any way in which God sees opportunity for me to improve? And again, I see opportunity every single day in the mirror. The idea isn't to take on all these self-deprecating, self-loathing thoughts, but is to lean in to the profound nature of grace that says, come what may, God, I believe that even in my shortcomings, you can redeem those things and help me improve over time. And James says some really intriguing things about communication. He gives us some imagery, which I find that in a lot of Bible studies, individuals skip over the imagery. And the metaphors in scripture are profound. If you wanna change the imagination, change the metaphor. And God is constantly trying to stretch our comprehension and the way in which we think and view things. Hey, think of it this way, think of it this way. So you have a broader, more robust understanding of God's work and his ways. And he starts out and he says, the tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. In other words, what he's saying is the tongue is powerful. This small four to six inch bit can control this large, powerful animal. That's a powerful thing. And most of us go through life casually engaging in relationships, not ever fully understanding the power of our words. Your words are powerful. And that can either be harnessed for the good or for the bad. Like nuclear energy can be used to make a bomb that destroys a city or for electricity that lights up a city. And the question is, is how do you harness the power of your words to destroy a situation or to brighten up a situation? And there's a powerful nature to our words that we can speak life into our marriages and hope and grace and love and joy and purpose and promise and destiny into those around us. Or we can project shame and lies and just all kinds of things that run against the grain of God's work in someone's life. Your words are powerful. In addition to that, your word, the tongue, is directional. So he says, you know, consider a ship. And though it is driven by strong winds, it is steered by a small rudder. Essentially what James is saying, this is a powerful idea. He's saying one of the main reasons why you are where you are is because of how you communicate. And one of the main reasons why you're heading where you're heading is because of how you communicate. He's saying your your words, your tongue, it has a directional impact upon your life. And so it is learning to say, okay, where in my life or how in my life are my words shaping the direction and the course of my relationships, my family, my friendships, right? They are directional. And lastly, the tongue is transcendent. He he says, consider a spark that creates an entire forest fire. Now, I, I grew up for a portion of my childhood in a town called Grand Junction, Colorado. It is on the the western slope of Colorado, and it is called Grand Junction because through the canyons come a few rivers, and they all meet within the valley. And on the western slope of Colorado, it is a very dry terrain. So we were very accustomed every single year to forest fires on that side of the mountains. And what happens every single year is These fires start, and you know, back then I remember watching the news and getting the updates similar to what you would do uh, maybe in a tornado season. And there was always this statement, and you would look for it because we were on one side of the valley, and they would say, the fire has jumped the river. And I remember as a kid thinking, I didn't know fires could jump rivers, but that's certainly the case. You, you find that in these forest fires in the Rocky Mountains, they not only jump rivers, they take over other mountains. And, and then what happens? 
The fire burns up all the vegetation, and what does the vegetation accomplish? It holds the soil in place. Well, then comes winter and a bunch of snow. Well, when all that snow begins to melt in the spring, what then happens with the soil? Mudslide. You had a forest fire that jumped rivers, burned up a bunch of mountainsides, burned up the vegetation, and what happened in one season is now creating a mudslide in another season. It wasn't an isolated event. And James is saying, yeah, there is a transcendent nature to your communication. And when you and I go through life thinking our conversations are just isolated situations, we foolishly miss the impact they're having on our life. How you communicate to your spouse actually impacts your children. How you communicate to your children actually has an impact on them and their relationships with their peers. How you communicate at work, and if you're constantly sabotaging your career through poor decisions in the workplace, that impacts your family. These are not isolated situations. Your communication has a transcendent impact. And so what you do in this situation, it bleeds over into this situation. And again, James is saying, you can either take this as like bad news, like, oh my goodness, my words are powerful and they're directional and they're transcendent. I'm doomed. Or you can think, oh, my words are powerful and they're directional and they're transcendent. This is great. Because of God's work in my life, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I'm gonna start speaking blessing and favor and God's best and goodness in the lives of those around me. This is gonna have an impact. Scripture says, out of the overflow of the mouth, the heart speaks, which means, folks, if it's in your words, it's in your heart. So what, every, like what you say and what I say says a lot about us more than it says about anyone else. You can learn a lot about a person just by listening to how they talk. And James is saying, yeah, understand this, that as people of God, we're called to represent something different. Now he takes the conversation further and he says, boom. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, again, this is a conversation for the family of God. If you're not a Christian, again, you're off the hook. You can dismiss everything we're saying. But if you are a Christian, if you say he's Lord and Savior, he's the king of my life, he's paid the ultimate price, and I've anchored my hope, my identity, and my eternity to him. Well, brothers and sisters, no, 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 this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And he's saying a lot there. He's saying, okay, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. I find this uh, comical uh, my kids are constantly coming home, and especially back in Minnesota early on, uh, I remember Riley coming home, and every single day we were unpacking things she was learning at school. And one day she came home, and she was like, Mom and Dad, what does it mean when someone says this? And she makes a statement, and it sounded like an exact quote from like a 90s gangster hip-hop album. It was like, whoa, don't say that, right? And it was full of profanity, and... She's about six, seven years old, and uh, Kristen says, babe, you don't want to say that. Those are cuss words. And Riley said, well, how do you know when a bad word is a bad word? And I'm sitting there, and Kristen's in the living room, and she's explaining this to Riley, and she's trying to articulate for a small child uh, the basics of discernment and the profound and beneficial nature of conviction. And Kristen says, you know, well, sometimes you'll just, you'll sense a conviction. And Chris, Riley says, well, what's conviction? And she says, you know, sometimes you'll bump into a situation, and if you pay attention, God will just inform you in your heart. Sometimes you'll get even an icky feeling, like, this isn't right. And you got to pay attention to those things. A few weeks go by, and some friends come over, and their mom was visiting from out of town. 
And she comes in and she introduces herself to Riley. Riley says, hi, my name's Riley. And she says, my name is so-and-so. And Riley goes, ooh, don't say that. <laughs> and she said, why? And Riley said, because that's a cuss word. And she said, no, it's not. That's my name. And Riley said, oh, well, it gave me an icky feeling. <laughs> and um, I say all that to say that in the Johnson home, this is still a work in progress. And here's what he's saying and here's what he's not saying. He says, out of the same mouth come blessings and cursing. He's not talking about cuss words. There's not, cuss words are not universal. There are other parts of the world that if you were to say the word bloody, it would be the equivalent of you saying the F word here in America. He's not talking about cuss words. What he's saying is when you bless someone, you are affirming and you are supporting and you are celebrating and honoring God's goodness, God's favor, God's purpose, God's plan and God's agenda for someone else's life. That's what you do when you bless someone. When you curse someone, Scripture says the devil came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he says when you curse someone, essentially is what he's saying is you are affirming, celebrating, honoring, supporting, and assisting the devil's work in someone else's life. Essentially, a person who participates in slander and gossip and false testimony is a person who is being pastored by the devil. Yeah, no one ever says amen to that one. <laughs> and he's saying, brothers and sisters, not us. As for me, as for us in our house, as for the people of God, out of our mouths do not come blessings and curses. And James is making this point, and he's kind of, I mean, this is a very pastoral conversation. And, and he's saying one of the surest ways to identify a person's spiritual maturity is pay attention to how they talk. And he's saying the person who participates in slander, the person who you know, gives himself over the jealousy that produces gossip, the person who spreads false rumors and testimonies, the person who does these things is a person who is letting you know that the redemptive work of God and the Holy Spirit's ability to empower them to do differently is empty within them. It is lacking that this is a person lacking spiritual maturity. I mean, that's a pointed thing. What James does, he says, here's a way for every single one of us, myself included, to evaluate our lives and say, okay, God, this comes really close to home. In fact, I'm seated around some people who are probably aware of my shortcomings in this area. God, would you help me walk the humble road? God, would you give me wisdom? Would you help me persevere along this journey? And God, would you help me lean into your grace? And would you accomplish in my heart and in my character what only you can accomplish? And over time, will you produce something in me that results in something coming through me because of your goodness? And that's the final closing argument of James. Can an olive tree produce figs? Can a, a spring of salt water produce fresh water? He's saying, as long as you're connected to the wrong source, again, now I'm pulling some of you non-Christians back into the conversation. As long as you're connected to the wrong source, your life is gonna produce undesirable fruit. It is only by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life that you and I can resemble anything godly, that you and I can produce any acts of righteousness. We cannot manufacture this on our own. It is only by God's goodness at work within our life that we be live beyond ourselves and beyond our ability. And God does something in us that at times we don't even know to pray for. And so maybe it's just recognizing Maybe I need to connect my life to a different source. And you've heard me say this before, but Jesus is the source, the course, and the force. He is not only the source of our identity, the source of our purpose, the source of unconditional grace, the source of joy, the source of peace. You could go on and on down the list. He is the source, but he's also the course. He, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the author, the finisher, and the perfecter of our faith. And he is the only perfect human being to ever step foot on this ball of dust within this galaxy. And he has laid before us a map and an example and has demonstrated 
This is what true life and the fullness of life looks like. He's the source. He's the course. I follow him. If I keep following him, it'll lead in the right direction. And he's the force. What does that mean? It is his power at work in my life that enables me to live like Jesus. Not because I've developed some Messiah complex. No, because I live every single day rooted at the foot of the cross. It is only by God's goodness that I produce any acts of righteousness. He's the source, he's the force, and he's the course. And I'm telling you, I think as a community, if we were to walk away today just saying, okay, God, where can we get better? Stop pointing fingers at culture. Stop pointing fingers at all the people who are disappointed and all the foolishness that we see around us. And what would happen if we developed the courage to stare ourselves into the mirror and say, God, I see the areas in my life that you are seeking to redeem and improve. And I think God might do something profound in our families that might have an impact within the world because our world desperately needs healthy, thriving, beautiful, loving, peaceful families. So as for me and as for you and your house, let's serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.